Good morning. Welcome to worship coming to you from the sanctuary of the First Presbyterian Church in River Forest, Illinois. We welcome you to this service of worship this morning with very, very great love. A few announcements before we begin. First of all, First Press is going to be offering a new members class uh, a little bit later this month, and we would love to have you as part of it. If you would like to learn more about First Press, uh, our mission, our ministry, our focus, about us. And uh, so please let me know uh, through the website or by calling the church office, by sending me an email, all that information is there. Let me know that you are interested and available, and we will schedule the time uh, based on the majority of availability that we have from folks. Also, coming up on September 12th, so just a month away, after worship, we're going to have a carnival, and it's going to be out here on Quick um, and the lawn, and uh, the staff and the deacons are working on this to make this a fun kind of welcome home experience. And so we invite you to save that date and uh, come and be part of that. Then also, uh, speaking of save the date, we want you to save the date of the weekend of October 8, 9, and 10. That's the time that we will be having our all-church retreat. Again, this year we will be in Wisconsin at uh, Camp Timberley, which is in East Troy, Wisconsin. Um, this is going to be a really special time this year because of the fact that we will be coming back together after the pandemic is mostly over, and we're taking all the necessary precautions. So uh, we are asking people to uh, come if you are vaccinated, and we will also do everything we can to make this a safe and a delightful experience for everybody involved. This morning, as we come to worship, our focus is worship. Our focus is on the beauty and the awe and the majesty and the glory of God. And so as we get ready to sing our opening hymn for our call to worship, I would like to read to you actually the entirety of Psalm 8. Listen and allow God's Spirit to draw you from wherever you have been into His presence. Lord our God, the whole world tells the greatness of Your name. Your greatness reaches beyond the stars. Even the babble of infants declares your strength, your power to halt the enemy and the avenger. I see your handiwork in the heavens, the moon and the stars you set in place. What are human beings that you should remember us? The human race that you should care for us. You treat us like gods dressing us in glory and in splendor. You give us charge of the earth, laying all at our feet, cattle and sheep, wild beasts and birds of the sky and fish of the sea, every swimming creature. Lord our God, the whole earth tells the glory of your name. Let us worship God.
Pray with me. Holy, awesome, loving, gracious, merciful, just God, we come before you as your people. We come before you not as perfect people, but as perfectly redeemed people. You have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. You have brought us together virtually and in person to sing your praise, to hear your word, to offer the heartfelt prayers from each of us. And you receive these with very great joy. Scripture tells us. And so we claim your presence here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, inspire our praise. Inhabit our praise. Send us at the end of this service into the world to embody your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the middle of a series of looking what Scripture calls us as the church to do. And this morning we're looking at the thing that most people associate most easily with church. Worship. You know, throughout 20 centuries, the church has worshipped God because of and in the name of Jesus. Throughout wars, throughout other pandemics, as nations and governments rose to power and others fell, in democracies, and in theocracies, and even under dictatorships, with amazing freedom, or in spite of unbelievable oppression. The apprentices of Jesus have worshipped him. Worship, prayer, and compassion. These three things are really the most constant acts of the true church, the marks really in their own way of the true church. And every generation, every generation throughout those centuries has its glorious moments in worship. <laughs> and the other kind too. Uh, there was a fad years ago uh, when uh, people were trying to be very, very creative about what they were coming up with for worship. And there were all kinds of resources published during this time of this kind of liturgical fad. One of them is one that I picked on particularly, actually mocked quite a bit to when I was teaching worship, because the worship would start out with a call to worship. And the worship leader, instead of citing scripture, would say, why are we here? And the congregation would furiously grab for their order of service to give the answer. Uh-oh. We are here to, and whatever it was. <laughs> it was actually kind of silly when you saw it happen. But that's really a legit question, isn't it? Why are we here? Why are you here? What's happening here? Why is worship so vital, so central to our life and to our church? What's God's intent for the worship that we share. Our reading today reports a conversation Jesus had that leads us directly into this subject in two important ways, discerning the truth and defining worship. And so this is going to be our text, spoiler alert, for this Sunday as well as for next Sunday when we're talking about maintaining the truth. But this conversation is between Jesus and someone who's about as far removed from the ways of Jesus and the knowledge of Jesus as you can get until now. Let's see what happens. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized but the disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, 
near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came along to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman says, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go tell your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestor is worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation comes from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you, I am he, the word of the Lord. So as we think about this, this thing we call worship, what are your thoughts? What comes to your mind? Obviously you can picture it, but what are you really think about. One of my go-to theologians, Karl Barth, wrote, Christian worship is the most monumentous, the most urgent, the most glorious action that can take place in human life. Think about that. Not just in human church, in human life. The worship of God, the most monumentous, the most urgent, the most glorious action that could take place. So what is worship, really? When I teach doctoral students and other worship leaders, I start by asking, what do you need for Christian worship? What do you have to have? And of course, the answers start piling in from different traditions and different experiences. And of course, it's a trick question, especially for people who have been worship planners, because they'll come up with all kinds of must-haves. But the answer is very simple. All you need for worship is God and a worshiper. That's all. Worship is one of the three great musts 
in John's gospel, and they all happen early on. John 3, 7, Jesus said, you must be born again. The new birth, conversion, redemption is a must for believers. John 3, 14, Jesus said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. It was God's plan that Christ had to die for redemption to happen, for new birth to happen. But John 4, 23, we just read it. All who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship, if we were back several centuries and speaking Middle English, would actually be called worth-ship. W-O-R-T-H, ship. The acknowledgement of God's worth. How do we acknowledge God's true worth? Well, (laughs) the first thing to know is that you can't on your own. I can't on my own. Left to ourselves, we'll never see God's true beauty. We just won't. There's too much that blinds us. We'll never consider how vast and how awesome God is. We don't have the mental capacity. The smartest people in the world do not have the mental capacity to grasp that part of God. And we will never be overwhelmed by his love left to our own. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. God is ready and able to assist you and me in worshiping him. (laughs) But it's the Spirit's power. That's what you and I can't see. And so we so easily fall back on the things that we can see, we can manage, we can touch. One um, group of people, many people actually, think about worship as what to do with their body. So we show up at the right place, we do the right stuff, all at the right time. We say the right words. This is what the Samaritan woman was thinking. Jews worship in Jerusalem. Samaritans worship on Mount Gerizim. And Jesus made the point that just showing up is not worshiping. Every Christian culture has its customs, has the things that it does, where we worship, how we sing, what order we do things in, how the scripture is explained. Is the congregation silent or responsive? Is this an adults only thing or do we invite children? How communion is done, how baptism is done differs from culture to culture, what the worship leader even wears. But true worship has nothing to do with any of that. On the other hand, for a lot of people, worship is a matter of emotion. Emotions can be stirred up in true worship. Absolutely they can. We can cry. Nothing wrong with that. We can experience overwhelming joy. We can experience overwhelming awe. But that doesn't mean that we're actually worshiping. Not really. William Barclay, Scottish biblical commentator, said true worship is where the immortal and invisible part of us seeks out and meets with God who is immortal and invisible. The immortal and invisible part of us seeks out and meets with God who is immortal and invisible. True worship in every sense, turns our attention away from ourselves, even away from how we're worshiping, and draws us closer and closer and closer to God. You know, C.S. Lewis, I love this, said, as long as you count the steps, you're not dancing. You're learning to dance. A good shoe is a shoe you don't notice. Good reading becomes possible when you don't need to think about the eyes or the light or the print or the spelling. The perfect church service would be one in which we were almost unaware of the service itself. Our attention would be always on God. Okay, so that's a little about worshiping in spirit. But what does it mean to worship God in truth? It means... That when you and I come to worship, we approach God honestly, truthfully, with our whole heart. Not just the little part that we set aside for Sunday activities. You know, Jesus complained in Matthew 15. 
These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Worshiping God in truth means that you worship God as He is revealed in Scripture, not the God that you and I create on our own. If we were to do that, do you notice that the God that you create looks an awful lot like you? Same priorities, same concerns, same values. We worship the God of Scripture, the God of truth. We don't worship a God of the political left or the political right. That's ideology. And we don't worship the God of certain types of music. That's idolatry. This is the reason for the centrality, by the way, of the pulpit in Reformed churches. John Calvin, the father of our whole branch of Christianity, would have put the pulpit right out there so that every place in the room had a clear line of sight, not to the preacher, but to the Scripture, to the Word of God. We worship God who is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But you see, that's, that's the moment when the penny dropped, as the British would say, for the Samaritan woman. She said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I am the way. I am the truth. I am and the life. That's the thing that we should be looking for every time we come to worship. Not thinking about how we do it, not analyzing the component parts. But did you join this webcast this morning expecting to encounter Jesus? Did you? Not just to hear about him. Did you come into prayer, truthfully? Did you come hopefully? Are you expecting that you will somehow or other be changed even just a little bit by having spent this time with us in worship? Did you come confident that God would meet you here? Those are the crucial questions. You know, I've talked with so many people over years of pastoral ministry, and a lot of them say things like, you know, well, I'm down with Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with that Old Testament God. I don't like him. That other God. Or, I don't know about Jesus, but I love it when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of me. Look at this passage about true worship. Do you see it? <laughs> the full cast of the Trinity shows up. God in three persons. The complete entourage. The focus is on the reality of God the Father. The one thing the Samaritan woman and Jesus had in common at the very beginning was worshiping God. But the focus is also God revealed in Jesus when Jesus said, I, the one speaking to you, I am the Christ, the Messiah. You knew I was coming one day, and today's the day. Here I am. But of course, the focus is ultimately on the activity of the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus speaking, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in Spirit and in truth. True worship is Trinitarian. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, all three seeking the world that God loves so much. All three seeking out you. We aren't in this life or we aren't in this service alone. God is here right now. Do you know that? So where are you this morning? Are you here out of habit? Is it part of your weekly routine, just sort of like going to the well? Did you think about encountering Jesus as you were tuning in this morning? 
Or were you just expecting a nice Sunday from First Press? Were you just expecting to hear things that you knew and maybe sing a song that you knew and get a little prayer in? What's your relationship with Jesus? Are you getting him a bottle of water? Or are you asking him for the living water that only he can give you? And what's Jesus revealing to you about yourself? Are you ready to hear it? Or are you working really hard to keep that Jesus-y facade in place? Guess what? He sees around it. Finally, did you come to actively worship or to just act out the script one and done. Do you sense that you are part of an audience this morning? Or even virtually, do you feel like you are part of a congregation of people seeking to grow closer to Christ? That's what we're shooting for, for you. You know, the Samaritan woman was going about her business. It was a normal midday. Until she met the Messiah, she'd always only heard about. She forgot why she was there. (laughs) The part that we didn't read, she left her jug, her water jug. She forgot about herself. She forgot about everything. She let her facade drop and she ran back to the town and was calling out, come see a man who knows absolutely everything about me and still loves me. Knows absolutely everything about me and still loves me. For her, that was worship. Meeting Jesus at that well in the middle of the day, that was her momentous, urgent, glorious moment. That thing that that was just better than anything that ever could have taken place in her life before or after. And you know what? It can be yours, too, right now. Another favorite commentator of mine, Dale Bruner, has translated part of this passage this way. The hour is coming. Indeed, it is happening right now when the true worshipers will be worshiping the Father by means of the Spirit and truth. So what I want to do is take a few moments in silence. I'd like you to do whatever it takes to reach out to God, to encounter Jesus. Picture yourself at that well. And Jesus is offering you water. And if you take it, you will never thirst again. After a few moments of silence, we're going to close with a song that leads us into prayer.
with me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we do give you all honor and all glory and all praise. You have called us into this place. You have brought us together virtually and in person. You have drawn us to you. Help us to worship. Help us to see your beauty even as we look around at all of the ugly things that can happen in this world. Help us to see your plan and your purpose even as we look around and see the world following its own devices and its own desires. Help us to feel the peace of your presence. Even though, as the hymn so beautifully says, there are fightings and fears within and without. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do glorify you. Even if it's with just a small portion of our heart, we glorify you. Help us to grow in our love for you and to learn of your love for us. Help us to be your people, released into this world, ambassadors of all you are. We pray for this world. We pray for our villages and for this city and for the cities and the nations around the world. Please, in your time, in your way, bring peace. Peace into our streets, peace among races, peace among political divides, peace where there is war, peace where there is terrorism. We pray for people who are suffering today at the hands of other people and by natural disasters. We pray for people who suffer in body or in mind or in spirit, in their own life, sometimes in their own isolation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the family of Francis Agozo, whose funeral we held in this room just yesterday. Especially for his children and his wife, Maria, give your peace, give your presence. Fill them with your love. Fill the void. Lord Jesus, we pray for students and teachers who are preparing to return to school. We ask that you would protect them. Protect them from the ravages of this virus, but also protect them from the ideological ravages of people on every side of any issue. Help them to find your beauty and your truth in science, in mathematics, in music, in language, in art, in dance, in sports. Lord Jesus, for each of us, you know our lives. You know all the things behind our very carefully crafted facades. You see right around them. And you love us still. Remind us. Remind us of your grace. Remind us of your truth. Remind us of your way. Help us to live in your life. And as we do this, help us each and every day to pray in the way that you have taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
was a kid in high school practicing organ every day at the First Presbyterian Church in Fremont, Ohio, there was a sign over every exit door. And the sign just simply said, Servant's Entrance. I'll never forget that. Because our worship service here is over, but our service in the world has just begun. So whether you're leaving this room or whether you're leaving your home to go out into the world, to go away from this service, this liturgy, this work, go now in peace and serve the Lord, loving and serving Him who loved you first. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.